Hello, everybody. My name is Thorsten Höffler. I'm a professor at ETH Zurich, and I'm glad that you're joining me today uh, for my talk on RDMA systems. So let me just, uh, security of RDMA systems. So let me just share the screen uh, right away and get to my presentation. So uh, first I have to say, I'm not a security expert. I'm a high performance computing uh, person, and I'm glad that I've been invited to talk at the Trustworthy Computing um, the Forum virtually in, in Singapore. So, um, I was asked to give a little bit uh, of an overview of the Parallel Computing Lab at uh, ETH Zurich, which I'm heading. And uh, I'm a high performance computing person at heart. So also my lab is focused mostly around high performance computing. And the idea here is that we combine applications such as deep learning, uh, weather and climate simulations uh, together with networks in a co-design where we mostly care about topologies and routing, but also about in-network processing as I'm going to talk about in, in a couple of minutes. Um, together with how to program these high performance computing systems. So we have this DACE framework, we are, we are also working and have been working on the message passing interface standard. So all these three aspects form uh, the co-design substrate that we are using in my lab in order to discover or develop the next generation high performance computing frameworks, but also large scale data center frameworks, which begin to look more and more like high performance computers. But this is not, uh, this overview is not the purpose of my talk today. So today I'm going to talk about specifically about the security of remote direct memory access systems. So here we have two papers in this area. One is a red mark in attack paper where we show various uh, exploits that can be attacked in today's systems, mostly in the data center context. And, um, well, and then a, a fix, of course, um, secure RDMA. So how can we get encryption authentication to RDMA-based systems? So of course, I'm not doing much of the work here. Uh, much of the work, uh, pretty much all of it has been done uh, by the wonderful students, Konstantin Taranov in my group and Benjamin Rotenberger in Adrian Perik's group, who is also a collaborator on this work. So all the credit goes to these two students. All the complaints should go directly to me. Um, so let me get started with what we mean by RDMA network, remote direct memory access networks. So here we see, um, let me just find the pointer. So here, here we see a high performance computing system, but it could be any data center uh, system. And then we see a node complex here in gray. So basically what's happening is that from the system, we are receiving, um, we are receiving packets that go through the RDMA processing engine in the RDMA NIC. So what is the key about RDMA? The key about RDMA is that the CPU, the host node, is not involved in depositing the data and processing the packets um, into main memory. So basically all that packet processing is done by the RDMA NIC. Uh, through the DMA unit, packets are processed into the input buffer in main memory. But of course, then eventually they will go through the CPU to be processed. Otherwise, I wouldn't need to receive them if they are never processed. So this is what's, what's happening today um, at a very high rate. Because if you look at Mellanox uh, Connect X6, we have basically one packet every 2.5 nanoseconds. If you're looking at uh, a twice as fast NIC that we will have very soon at 400G, we are receiving one packet at every about one nanosecond. So that is of course a massive uh, speed. And to process all of these packets, even for security reasons, is uh, problematic in the host uh, complex. So what happened? Is that we have these RDMA NICs, as I just mentioned. So these things are highly uh, specialized packet processing engines that can actually deposit these uh, packets at this rate into main memory. And again, there is no involvement of the CPU. But now the question is, can we use um, this RDMA processing NIC also in a secure manner? Because right now, RDMA processing only has very limited uh, capabilities, as we will talk about, in, in terms of uh, trustworthy computing and, and security in general. So RDMA has recently <laughs> gotten a lot of attention, as we can see here. These are all various papers uh, published at systems conferences about RDMA. I myself have been working on RDMA uh, since uh, early 2004. Um, when it was getting uh, more popular in the high performance computing space. Since then, we have used it in the high performance computing space, basically the uh, standard network. And, and only at around 2015, I would say, it became popular in the data center context. But today, many data center providers are actually exclusively um, deploying RDMA systems for performance reasons, because network speeds require you to do some form of packet um, processing or packet offload, uh, packet processing offload. So, at the end, RDMA was designed for performance. So we basically get lower latency, higher bandwidth, and lower CPU utilization. That was the design goal. There was no security in the design goal because at the first uh, instantiation of RDMA, this was designed for high-performance systems that didn't have such stri strict security, um, uh, security 
requirements like systems today in the data center context in a multi-tenant shared environment. So there may be vulnerabilities, there may be exploits, and there may be mitigations for those. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about uh, in, in the talk today. So I want to get started right away with the, uh, with, with the first part of the talk where, we, where I explain how you can exploit today's RDMA systems with uh, various attacks. So in fact, we under four different adversarial models, we identify 10 uh, vulnerabilities and implemented six different attacks using combinations of uh, the vulnerabilities for a given combination of adversary models. And we also propose mitigations for many, not all of them, but most of them will be um, fixed in the, in the second part of the talk as, uh, that we call secure RDMA, where we have a fully authenticated and encrypted RDMA protocol that we are proposing. So this is, by the way, published at USENIX Security um, 20. And uh, you, can, you can find the paper at the, uh, at the bottom reference. So what is RDMA? So RDMA is, is a specific packet format uh, in, in the as an implementation detail that is very similar to any networking packet processing uh, format. So the idea here is that we have some headers um, that, that give us routing information, protocol processing information, then some additional RDMA information, then we have payload in the packet, and of course, a checksum. So you could imagine, if you're familiar with the TCP IP uh, packets, which you probably are, um, that the routing header is very similar to the IP routing header. The base transport header is then very similar to TCP or UDP, which gives you the endpoint matching information. So the routing header basically gives you the path through the network. The base transport header gives you all the information that the endpoints need to process in order to match it to the right connection, to put it into the right buffer and, and, and whatnot. And then the RDMA header, header itself has the target virtual address and then gives you even more information after you've matched to the, info, uh, to the application or to the virtual memory space then you uh, have a, some kind of authentication key for the memory, uh, a length and the virtual address. So these three components are necessary for RDMA. Um, so what happens if you go uh, to an, uh, towards an RDMA NIC or through an RDMA NIC, you have these packets arriving, then you first check the CRC because if the CRC is, is not working out, then you can discard the packet immediately. Then you do a queue pair matching where you're basically looking at the base transport header, you somewhat can ignore the routing header at this point because it's already arrived at the right, uh, right uh, host. Uh, you do queue pair matching, then you look at the, whether the packet sequence number is correct for that queue pair, and then you check uh, the access credentials in the R key, and then you do virtual address translation in the NIC, and eventually through the PCI Express bus and the DMA engine that I showed on the previous slide, you deposit the, the data into main memory. This is all done on the NIC. And this is quite interesting because the first couple of stages are completely silent to the application. So if I'm receiving a corrupted packet, the NIC will silently discard it. Okay, that's probably not a problem. But the second uh, observation is that if the queue pair doesn't match, the NIC is silently discarding my packet. Also, if the queue pair does, uh, queue, uh, sorry, the packet sequence number does not match, the NIC is silently discarding my packet because it's assuming that it's a duplicate or an out of order delivered packet. But we, I'm going to show you how we can use this uh, to trick uh, the NIC um, into, um, yeah, into giving us access where we shouldn't have access. However, these uh, once Q pair and sequence number are matched to the correct connection, then we have these access um, checks basically. So one is checking the R key, which is really the access key. So we could imagine this to be some kind of, um, yeah, well, access key, as I just mentioned. Um, so some capability that, that, you, that the other side must have. And then we have a virtual address translation, which of course checks whether the address that you are um, specifying belongs to the R key and has been approved by the user application on the destination to be uh, read or write accessible. If anything bad happens there, uh, you get a connection error. So let's uh, please remember this and I'll get to this in a couple of minutes. Um, so now, if we look at the, the simplest one, we need to pass a CRC check. Uh, if we now want to generate packets, which is relatively easy, so we can build our own packets in the Rocky format, not so much in the original InfiniBand specification. This is another historical um, interesting observation that in the original InfiniBand specification, it was not easy to inject arbitrarily crafted packets into the network. Then InfiniBand was lifted to, to be running over ethernet, this RDMA over converged ethernet, of course, ROC, uh, or short Rocky, R-O-C-E, um, where basically our InfiniBand packets are encapsulated into IP UDP packets. And of course, as we all know, we have things like raw sockets or even fast libraries like DPTK, the data plane development kit of Intel, where we can very, very fast design our own packets and inject them into the network. So now we have a new attack vector that I can basically shoot arbitrary packets uh, through the data center network to my RDMA destination NIC. And this is what we're going to exploit. 
Um, so, of course, the CRC checksumming is easy. I mean, if I know the checksumming protocol, which, which I know, uh, this provides absolutely no uh, security. And we have these four uh, adversary models. So basically going from uh, weaker to uh, stronger. So T1 is, is the weakest one in some sense. It basically means an attacker has a normal end host, so not even an, an, a privileged uh, access end host in, um, in the same network. So privileged access locally, because that, that we assume that that attacker can send arbitrary packets, but it doesn't need to have privileged access to the network. That's what I mean. Uh, T2 is an attacker who now has a compromised end host, um, can inject arbitrary packets. And then T3 is an in-network attacker, like a malicious switch, for example, or anybody else who can, uh, who can eavesdrop on connections. And T4 is now a malware-based attack where I'm actually co-locating my attacker with some application in the, uh, well, at the target, uh, in the target memory domain. Okay, so, so we will be discussing mainly uh, T2 and T3. So, okay, now the first, uh, first point we have to exploit if we want to eject arbitrary packets, we have to somehow guess the right queue pair number. So if you're an, an in-network attacker, then it's very simple right? because we just observe the queue pair number in the packet and we can just use it. Um, if we are not an in-packet, uh, in-network adversary, so if we don't have access to the existing packets, we have to guess it. Well, an interesting observation is that the queue pair numbers are just 24 bits wide. So we have less than 17 million different uh, queue pair numbers, but it's even worse uh, from a security perspective because these queue pairs are allocated sequentially in practice. So all the NICs that we looked at, uh, all the drivers of the network cards that we looked at, ranging from Broadcom to Mellanox to a soft rocky implementation um, that is implementing this per, uh, in software, establishes the queue pair number sequentially even across uh, different applications. So it's very easy to guess the queue pair number. They all start at some constant and then they go um, yeah, sequentially. So now that we are, have an easy time get, guessing the queue pair number, let's look at the packet sequence number. Can we have to guess that as well? Um, so P, packet sequence numbers are also 24 bits. And uh, unfortunately, the InfiniBand specification leaves it up to the user to choose a starting packet sequence number. So basically, when you establish a connection, um, the driver or, or the, the, um, the application tells the driver the initial packet sequence number to start with. And of course, uh, most applications say something like zero. Um, there is a specific uh, mechanism uh, given the, uh, that's called the RDMA connection manager, where you can delegate the connection establishment to some other software in the network. Um, and that connection manager will actually use random uh, packet sequence numbers, so truly random packet sequence numbers. Or maybe not truly, but pseudo random, at least hard to guess packet sequence numbers. So, and uh, this, this is now, of course, an option. So InfiniBand leaves this option to the developer, whether the developer uses RDMA CM, the connection manager, plucks in his or her own uh, packet sequence number or just a wi uh, wisely chosen packet sequence number or just a constant. And if we look at various uh, um, open source in implementations here, so we looked at six different open source um, library or uh, open source uh, softwares that use RDMA, um, four out of the six uh, simply use a constant in their initialization. So it's very easy to guess the packet sequence number. Um, two out of those use the RDMA connection manager. Um, so uh, where we get a real, really random uh, PSN. But the interesting observation is that even the PSN is not a big uh, protection because we implemented a tool, uh, what we call our Rocky spoofing tool, where we can, through Mellanox, Mellanox Connect X um, adapter, we can generate about 1.6 million packets per second. And it takes us about 11 seconds to enumerate 24 bits. And remember uh, the packet sequence number drop if it's wrong or if it's incorrect, um, the NIC is just silently dropping at the destination NIC. So there's no notification to the user and uh, it does not break any connection. So it's simply, uh, the simply packets are dropped. So what I can do with this, I can actually inject or replace packets and um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. There are, there are some more implications of this that I don't have time to talk about, uh, but we can talk about this in the question session if you have, because what you also do is you increment, uh, when you inject or replace a packet, you increment the number and you're actually, the real packet from the real endpoint is going to be discarded. <laughs> so, so there are some interesting options you can use this for. Um, so of course, mitigation strategies are that you could either use uh, secure RDMA, which I will be talking about in the second part of the talk. You could use a random Q pair number um, which 
which will help you, or you can use a random PSN. So both of these together will actually lead to a reasonable security. So if you if you can, uh, the, the combination of the two, so two to the 24 times two to the 24 is a, is a rather large space. Um, we could also monitor hardware counters to detect these attacks. So if I get a lot of packets suddenly that don't do a lot of traffic in the uh, at the back end, so in, in memory, then something is wrong, right? So these hardware counters exist. Um, so now the question is, what can we do with this after we have guessed the uh, Q pair and the packet sequence number? Well, one first attack is we could force Q pairs into error state. So we could basically disconnect existing Q pairs. So a very simple denial of service attacks. So if I can pass the first three checks, uh, CRC, Q pair matching, and, and PSN, and I'm just sending an arbitrary packet into this uh, destination, Nick, the connection will drop. Uh, most of the um, applications for RDMA will actually fail after a connection, uh, uh, after a Q pair movement into the error state will uh, fail for good. So, so the, most of them do not handle this case and they will just uh, essentially abort like with a sec fault or something like this. So you have implemented a full DOS attack with this. Um, so as I mentioned, we can have 1.6 million packets per second. Um, we can really quickly scan those. So essentially if we know the packet sequence number or we know the, um, the Q pair number, uh, we, uh, it takes us 11 seconds to, to, to disconnect the connection. Um, of course, uh, one mitigation technique is, as I mentioned, um, if we have both a Q pair number and a packet sequence number random, then it's going to be very hard. So we, we did the simulation. Um, if the victim has 1000 connections active, we can only break one by randomly guessing uh, of those connections in a 48 hour time frame in expectation. So, so even if we fire at 1.6 million packets per second, because that, that range is very large. Um, okay. So, uh, but of course, denial of service is simple. And, and yes, we can denial of service essentially all existing hard DMA <laughs> uh, open source applications that we looked at um, very easily. But what about guessing the R key and actually getting an access to the real data at the destination? So an R key is a key that is 32 bits wide. Um, that, that sounds great. But unfortunately, the generators for the R key are pretty predictable. So we found in, in an analysis that, that you can see here for, for the number of of actually random bits in these 32 bits, it's, it's less than three. Uh, for some of them, it's actually zero. <laughs> so you can pretty much deterministically guess R keys for some of the NICs. Um, so for example, some NICs do static initialization for key generation after a reboot. So they just have the same key all the time after they reboot it. Um, also, many applications use uh, the, uh, the same protection domain for all Q pairs. Uh, which is also somewhat uh, a very bad idea. I didn't introduce the concept of protection domain yet, but think about it like a virtual address space that spans multiple nodes. So this is one domain, it's, it's a, an, another form of key, so to say, that, that needs to be distributed that kind of spans uh, multiple nodes. Um, and then of course, uh, what's even more critical, so somehow the key generator state is shared across applications across different protection domains in pretty much all the drivers we looked at. So you can see the here shared key generation. So many do a static initialization, uh, many do, or all of them do uh, shared key generation. And here we found, this is the increment step uh, between uh, two successive uh, R key generations. So some of them just incremented by, by zero X 100. Uh, so also not so great. Uh, some of them use randomness, but with very low entropy. And, and please look at the uh, paper for more details. There's a, a long discussion on this that I don't have time to go into. So basically we can now pretty much guess the R key as well because it's only three bits of randomness in there. So now the last question is, can we guess the virtual address? And virtual addresses are 64 bits. So they're even harder to guess. However, in Linux, system, all Linux systems, only 48 bits of these 64 bits are actually used. In fact, uh, most developers use page aligned memory, um, which is very beneficial for performance, of course. And then we have only 36 bits to guess. Well, it's even worse because usually the memory allocator um, gives you somehow consecutive addresses in memory, unless you have memory address uh, randomization on, but, but many don't, um, with respect to some random address space. So which basically means if I'm connecting, like we, we tested this with a specific implementation uh, that is InfiniSwap. So that's an, a remote swapping device for Linux. So that swaps contents of the main memory to some remote RDMA connected network card. So that could be crucial information like uh, uh, keys, access keys, uh, encryption keys and things like this. So we, we looked at the InfiniSwap daemon. It uses POSIX memoline in a loop and registers buffers uh, of one gigabyte. And now, of course, if it's you doing this in a loop, the attacker, and we, we check this for real, 
is able to predict the position because the attacker could just connect to the InfiniSwap daemon, um, grab one of those pages, and then it has the random start address or something that's relative to the random start address and then can uh, compute all these offsets. So oh, great, uh, we can actually read a remotely swapped memory. Uh, maybe not such a great idea. So we can implement this. Um, um, basically, as I just mentioned, you connect to a public service, you acquire the addresses, um, and then you just assume that the software is not so well implemented. So basically, all of those uh, that we checked are, in fact, not so well implemented in that, uh, in that context. And um, we can kind of guess even the virtual address. So it's, it's of course, even simpler for an in-network adversary, because if I can see the traffic, well, then I'm just seeing the addresses in, in plain text. So <laughs> it's, it's much easier. But even if I have no privileged access to the network, if I just have access to one host, I can run these kinds of attacks. Uh, that, this is uh, quite scary for me. Uh, mitigations, again, use SRDMA, uh, randomize your R keys. Um, we actually have some R key randomization algorithms in the paper that you can use for this. Um, randomize addresses of allocated memory, do not share uh, protection domains across anything that is not uh, trusted, and then use type two memory windows um, that, that you can also read up. I don't have enough time to go into details here. So another attack we can do, and now I have to go a little bit faster, is that we can basically um, DOS an RDMA system with QPAIR exhaustion. So it's very much like an, an attack on the TCP stack where you just use up all the resources of, of the, uh, all the file descriptors, for example, of the destination memory. You can do very much the same in an RDMA system um, with the big difference that the QPAIR limit is much smaller than the typical number of file descriptors in an operating system. So in theory, you could have two to the 24. In practice, you have at most 260,000. Um, so now, now the question is whether RDMA capability devices can num limit the number of uh, QPAIR connections from the same endpoint like we do in TCP stacks typically today. Well, the answer is unfortunately today, as far as I understand, not. So we should probably invest into this in the future. Um, what we can also do is a performance degradation attack. Um, so this is an interesting attack. If I just want to degrade the performance of a target host, I can in fact send a lot of silent RDMA packets eating up all the bandwidth of this host without the host even realizing. So uh, we have implemented this attack. Um, we have shown that uh, for slowing down RDMA reads, oops, we can actually slow down the read latency by a factor of 10. And given the fact that RDMA is mostly used because of its low latency in the single digit uh, microsecond range, well, delaying it by a factor of 10, which if we just have eight attackers in the network, could be detrimental to a service. Like imagine I'm in the cloud and I want to, uh, I, I want to annoy uh, the customers of my uh, of my competitor. I just need eight VMs and I can probably I can mostly shut down the the, the low latencies that the, the customer is uh, expecting here. And and you all know that there's a large fan out in most of the data center applications that we have today, consisting of tons of microservices that may rely on this latency. Um, also, the throughput we could reduce by a factor of 10x, of course, for small packets. Um, for RDMA writes, it's a little bit less impressive. So we, we can delay um, or, or we, we can reduce RDMA writes, but basically um, only relative to the, uh, to the uh, number of attackers. So, so we, have, we get about an 8x slowdown, so not a 10x. So 10x is a little bit super linear. Um, so now is, is another interesting uh, observation that I just want to make very briefly. So can an ad adversary use RDMA to attack applications? Well, actually, yes. So what you could do, um, and, and this is very hard to detect in effect, what you could do is that an, an, an attacker could inject a malware into the application that registers memory for RDMA read remotely and basically opens a window through this malware into that application's memory address space. And then the attacker can just scan uh, for passwords and all of these things. Uh, so you could basically, <laughs> Um, use this as, as a mechanism um, to connect quickly to remote memory, very similar uh, to, to the attacks that, that we know um, for various uh, protocols where you can just dump the whole memory of a machine. Um, so of course, mit mitigation would be code attestation, so don't run malware in, in, in this sense. So now let me get to uh, fixes. We have uh, the proposal is secure RDMA as a lightweight security extension to RDMA which uses uh, symmetric keys uh, to provide header auth authentication, packet authentication, payload encryption, and memory protection. So I will talk about each of those. And so we prevent all of the, all of the attacks, including eavesdropping, and we are basically backwards compatible with that protocol to InfiniBand, Rocky v1, and Rocky v2. So it's relatively easy to implement this if you are a vendor of, of RDMA systems. 
Um, so how does it work? So first, we introduce a new uh, secure, reliably, uh, reliable connected Q pair. So all, all this Q pair needs is an additional symmetric key and the type of the uh, a type what it should use for cryptography. So we have uh, we support a plethora of different uh, security codes. So hash-based message authentication codes, cipher-based message authentication codes, and then also full authenticated encryption codes, uh, namely AES and Poly 1305. And so this is kind of a, a standard package of different codes that you could run, and we basically choose them based on their performance. So, but now what, we, what do we do with the packet format? Well, I mentioned the RDMA header before, so the routing header, the base transport header, the payload, we're ignoring the, the addresses here, and the checksum. So there is a proposal, um, which is in fact available in Mellanox uh, Connect X6 uh, uh, DX products um, that implements IPsec um, in RDMA. So the idea here is that IPsec encrypts and protects everything to the right. So the base transport header, the payload, and the checksums. What we are proposing in SRDMA is to uh, move the SRDMA header um, further to the right. So we do only protect the payload and the checksums and not necessarily the base transport header, which doesn't allow you to gain uh, too much insight into the, the, into the uh, client. And we have this because we can actually use this protocol backwards compatible with InfiniBand today which is impossible with IPsec because it's, of course, as the name implies, it's the internet protocol. So you can only use it with Rocky. Um, and um, we also, we also don't, have, uh, we don't have to process the security stack even if we are running into um, an, an attack at this level. So if somebody tries to exhaust the resources through the base transport header, um, we will not run our encryption engines or decryption engines hot. So it kind of reduces the denial of service attack surface that I mentioned earlier. So now we have this base transport header here, um, where we basically use the existing InfiniBand base transport header, and we extend uh, three out of the seven reserved bits to indicate the presence of a secure header. So there are already uh, seven reserved bits. We use uh, three out of those to choose between different uh, max sizes, and, and zero basically means there is no encryption. So by the way, we implemented all of this in a smart NIC, as I will get to in a couple of minutes. Um, so this protocol is actually really working and it's open source and you can, uh, you can look it up yourself. Um, furthermore, of course, we, we now need to protect against replay attacks, right? So that's a typical, uh, a typical attack. So which means we must have some nonce that is never reused or at least not reused for a very long period of time. And um, the, the nice piece about this nonce is it can be predictable and it's transmitted in clear because it doesn't actually matter, but it must just never be uh, reused. And uh, you could think about, well, we could use the packet sequence number, um, great. But unfortunately, packet sequence number is only 24 bits. So which means uh, for small packets, after 80 milliseconds, uh, this thing wraps around and uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you're reusing your nonce and then you could run a replay attack. So this is not such a great idea. Um, because Mellanox Connect X5 can send up to 200 million messages per second. So um, what we do is we basically extend uh, this packet sequence uh, number counter to 64 bit by keeping a local counter of size 64 bit. And uh, whenever it wraps around the 24 bit counter, we just increase that local counter um, by, by one. So the, the least uh, significant bits are not transmitted. Um, so sorry, this should be the most significant bits here. Uh, no, sorry, it's actually least significant bits, exactly. So there, they are the, the fastest changing bits are transmitted and the other ones are just counted locally at source and destination and in boom, we have 64-bit nonce emulated. So now let's get a little bit more into, uh, into the meat of it. So how do we now implement the header authentication? So we basically um, take a, a message on the authentication code that is based on the shared key AB the, the nonce, uh, the routing header, and the base transport header. So, so this is for the header authentication. Uh, for the packet authentication, so header authentication only protects or authenticates the routing header and the base transport header. If we want to protect the whole payload, well, we, we just include the payload in the, um, in the Mac. Uh, it's, of course, more expensive uh, to protect the whole payload. So depending on what you want and the resources available, you may want to choose the just header authentication. So with header authentication, you just know that you received the message from the right source, but you don't know if you received the right data from the right source. And then, of course, you could also have payload authenticated encryption, where you uh, encrypt and uh, authenticate and encrypt all of the data uh, that is in each packet. So this is now full secrecy or full confidentiality. So now if you look at the overheads uh, comparing our protocol to IPsec, so the key overhead is basically the same. So we have 16 bytes, uh, if that's our key length, 
times the number of connections. The nonce counter is uh, ours is smaller because we have to play this trick because we are reusing uh, the 24 bits. And the header is, is also smaller um, because we have we are reusing the 24 bits that are already the, the nonce that is already in the uh, InfiniBand header, while in IPsec we would be adding, adding an additional header, very relevant for, some, for very small packets and message rate, uh, things like this. So then what we could even do is we could even go a bit further and we could say, well, we could also reduce the memory overhead further to not have it scale with the number of connections by using a key derivation protocol where we have one key per protection domain. Remember protection domains is something where everything inside the protection domain trusts everything else inside the same protection domain. So if you pay attention when you initialize these protection domains, you can actually share the keys, but you probably don't want to share the keys, but you can derive keys from a PD key for each connection. And this is exactly what we do. So two endpoints can derive the exact same symmetric key based on the, um, on the adapter port address, the Q pair number on, on the source, as well as the destination. Um, so the, the overhead is now, is now reduced here. So from 16 uh, by times n, we basically reduce it to 16 bytes if all of these n connections are trusted among each other in the shared, in the same protection domain. Um, so then what we also have is extended memory protection. Um, so where we basically remember this R key that is so easy to guess, um, we, you can use that R key where to, to send it from endpoint A to endpoint B. And every endpoint who has it can actually access the memory. That's what I explained before. And now the endpoint B can send it to endpoint C and endpoint C can still access the memory at endpoint A. But what we can now do is we can, in fact, instead of sending the whole R key to a memory region, we can uh, use a cryptographically safe uh, function that takes the start address and the end address of a specific region or subregion of that memory and um, encrypts it together with the, with the key for the whole memory region and gives you a new key that is now for the subregion, right? So you can now do a subregion delegation. Um, and for this, we actually do not introduce extra headers because we are just reusing our message authentication code in the secure transport header that we already have. So it comes at no additional overhead, just a little bit of computational overhead for the key derivation uh, protocol. So now, as I mentioned, we implemented all of this um, on a specific smart NIC. So uh, thanks to the company Broadcom who donated us uh, two Broadcom Stingray PS225 NICs. Um, so they're to be praised here. These, these NICs include um, eight core ARM A72s, have eight gigabyte DRAM, so pretty powerful machines. Unfortunately, the connection to the um, to the packet processing pipeline is, is suboptimal. I'll talk about this later. But most importantly, this uh, NIC supports crypto acceleration. So perfect target for implementing secure RDMA on the NIC. And it's a dual 25 gigabit uh, per second NIC. Um, there's only one of these uh, two, um, only one of these two ports is smart. So we can only use uh, the 20, 125 per gigabit per second NIC. In fact, the line rate that we measured together with Rocky is about 20.6 gigabit. So now if you look at the processing capability for these various um, uh, codes here, ranging from AES over poly 1.1305 to SHA, uh, which is just a message authentication code, and various packet sizes from 64 bytes, 1,024 uh, 1, uh, 1, bytes, 2,048 bytes, um, and different numbers of threads here on the uh, x-axis, we can see that we can, for large packets, all of the codes can reach line rate. For small packets, not all of the codes can reach line rate, but some can. So AES, for example, is, is pretty good, uh, specifically for small packets. So this is uh, so this NIC works for, for this uh, kind of exercise. So how did we implement SRDMA? Basically repeating what I already described. Um, so we take a message from host A. Uh, oh, sorry, we first establish Q pairs, of course, from, ho from host A to the NIC. Uh, on both sides. Then we establish queue pairs between the two endpoints. So this is how um, the, the smart NIC works uh, in this particular setting, this Broadcom smart NIC. So we have queue pair from a host to the NIC, and then a queue pair from the NIC to the NIC, and then a queue pair from the NIC to the other host. Um, then we uh, RDMA write a message from the host to the, the smart NIC A. The smart NIC A does all the processing that I mentioned. So the host doesn't do any security processing, no overhead there. Uh, and then uh, sends this protected packet to smart NIC B. Smart NIC B removes the header, authenticates everything, discards packets that are invalid and also potentially notifies the host of invalid packets if, if wished, and then uh, commits the plain text message towards host B. So it's fully transparent to the application at host A and host B. They will just see a normal RDMA connection, but it's uh, secured by the smart NIC implementation. So now if you look at the, uh, the performance that the application observes, 
So the no security baseline for the RDMA write latency is about 10 microseconds. Uh, so it's, it's not so great um, because we have all these different hops. The read latency is about uh, eight, 17 to 18 microseconds. But um, the basic uh, protocol processing of just um, packet protection, uh, oh, sorry, packet authentication does all of this. So if you now um, do key derivation on addition to this, so now this means this, this experiment is with the worst case key derivation, in fact. So meaning that there is a cache miss. So we have a small cache for these keys, but we simulate a cache miss every single time we receive a packet or uh, authenticate a packet. So for these two, so the latency gets slightly higher, uh, actually substantially higher for some of these protocols. Looking at AES, it still looks reasonably good. And then if we have two uh, uncached key derivation uh, implementations, then it gets even slower. Right? So that's uh, quite obvious. But we are still in the area of, of reasonable latency, I would say. So now uh, for the packet authentication, um, we, we differ between the read latency and, and the write latency. So read latency is of course um, longer than the write latency because we have send a request packet and receive a reply packet. Well, write latency is literally just one uh, half round trip time. So if we compare those, you, you can see, well, um, they're reasonably fast for, for the basic case. And then they, they slow down slightly the more features you add, right? So um, this is all packet level uh, authentication here. But, but yeah, there's, uh, if, if we now add the full encryption latency, we have a very similar behavior. It gets a little bit slower. Um, we would recommend to use AES. Um, in, in most cases, AES-128, but sometimes Poly-1305 is actually faster. But this is a, a software choice. Um, so for the write bandwidth, it's very similar. So we show here the roof line where we have uh, simply no encryption. Um, if we add encryption, for uh, just the header authentication. Well, we are staying very close to the roof line um, because, well, it's, it's basically uh, only the header that's authenticated. Uh, if we now authenticate the full packet, it's getting much slower. And if we now encrypt the full packet, um, the overhead over the full packet authentication is not that big because, well, for authentication, you need to read the whole packet, process your whole packet. For encryption, you do basically the same thing and just send a different packet. Um, so here, if we just do the basic case, uh, you see this performance. If we add, again, a single miss, you can see it, a, a degradation for the very small uh, messages. Oh, this is actually a number of threads. I apologize, not, not messages. So by the way, you need multiple threads to saturate uh, the bandwidth here. It's also an interesting observation. You have four threads at least. Um, so, and, and, and this is for very large messages here. And you can basically see very little difference between these, these extended protection mechanisms because the cache miss that we provoke is of constant size. And of course, for a large message, that is not uh, too critical. So for the read bandwidth, um, where we have the context and software, we are basically uh, even more limited. Uh, so we don't get to the 20 gigabyte per second, but more like a little bit more than 15. But we see a very similar pattern as on the left side. And I don't want to go too much into detail. You can find all the data in the paper. Um, so then uh, this paper also includes uh, a very nice mechanism that I don't have time to talk about for memory subdelegation. So in fact, you can derive keys along a tree and then delegate subregions of the regions that you have access to to a third party. So I'm getting access to region A. Uh, I'm, I'm now giving access to a third party of, to a subregion of region A, a very interesting uh, capability. So then we do a, a full uh, packet verification pipeline that you can look at as a state diagram. We also implemented a, a full key value store um, or changed the full key value store and ran it over SRDMA, the herd key value store. And we found that the, um, the overhead is negligible. And then we have uh, various results for mixed read and write workloads, very similar to the previous uh, slides that I've shown you. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and give you a little bit of an outlook of what we are planning to do. So here we have well, what I mentioned at the beginning. We have the attack, uh, various attacks. We showed implementations for those attacks. You can download the code and run it yourself. Uh, we have cleared this all with the, uh, with the vendors. So they had enough time to fix all of those bugs. Um, we have implemented uh, the proposal for SRDMA to have a secure RDMA implementation. We have implemented that all on the SmartNIC. And the next step is now to lift the constraints of this, uh, of this SmartNIC, as I mentioned, the packet processing pipeline is quite slow and a little bit cumbersome um, to something that we call spin mix, uh, steam, uh, streaming processing in the network towards fully trusted distributed environments. So uh, something that we could even collaborate on. Um, so now the, the streaming processing in the network, I just want to quickly give a, a brief overview of this. Um, so this is basically an abstract machine model 
that you could see a SCUDA for packet level network acceleration. So the CPU downloads a handler to, to the NIC itself, and then the NIC executes this handler and handler processing units on every single incoming packet before it uh, commits this to memory. So basically you could implement sRDMA as a set of these handlers um, if you had real hardware. Talking about real hardware, we in fact have real hardware, at least in a simulation, um, that is the Pulp Spin uh, open source uh, NIC processing engine. So it's a fully open RISC-V based uh, NIC processing architecture that, that, is, um, that is published and publicly available. And one of our next steps may be to turn this into a fully trusted uh, sRDMA processing but uh, we would need stronger uh, or faster encryption for this first. But with that, I would like to conclude my talk and um, thank you very much for uh, listening.